So hi everyone. Um, as always, I'm Kirsten Winkler. We made it to EduQuest episode 100 after, well, quite some years. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm very happy to have my 100th guest and a very special one, uh, at Tech Girls maybe. Um, so welcome Audrey Waters um, and... Yeah, I hope Thank we'll have you. a fun talk and um, see where this where is the is good. <laughs> um, okay, let's start with a little bit of um, background. I know that probably many people here read Hack Education. Uh, you contribute, of course, to to other um, uh, outlets, blogs um, in more probably the higher education space and um, what was what was the landscape back in uh, 2010 when you started Hack Education and um, to sort of give the EduQuest audience I guess who come more from the entrepreneurial maybe investor side um, sort of a um, an idea of why you started uh, doing what you do um, so Back in 2010, I was working for Read Write Web, uh, Read Read Write now, and I was really frustrated because I noticed that there were an increasing number of education startups that just weren't getting covered. Um, I was told frequently that nobody cares about education, investors don't care about education, entrepreneurs don't care, but I was seeing already signs that there was certainly a growing number of, of startups that were paying attention to education and paying attention, I think, in new ways. Rather than selling directly to schools or school districts, they were going directly to teachers or students, um, having different business models, uh, you know, uh, tr testing out the freemium business models and so on. So I decided, well, if, if I can't write about it for Read Write Web, I'll just start my own blog. Um, and that's and that's what I did. So, and I think paying attention to not just to the kinds of stories that the tech blogs cover, which tend to be who got funding, product you know product launches, but also trying to make sure that um, to ask questions about how are these shaping the way we teach and learn, not just how are we going to um, think about this new or changing market, but really fundamentally how do these new technologies. Um, what difference will they make in the classroom to learners? Yeah, how things have changed, um, you said, in 2010. And I think at that time, yeah, it probably just got started. So um, I started my own blog, so my private blog, the Kirsten Winkler um, one, I think in... January or February 2009, and then at mm -hmm. request a little later in um, in September of uh, 2009, and yeah, back then it was really like um, it was still like oh, education, yeah, nice, but uh, yeah, it's not yeah. interesting or not um, like a a real business or uh, generally nothing very exciting. Whereas then, um, I guess 2010 and a little bit later, it uh, really, and what we see now, of course, it has really uh, turned into something, um, oh, wow, education, and it's so important. And, um, of course, uh, startups or services uh, popping up all the time now and uh, yeah education really seems to be one of the things of uh, the moment but uh, yeah we shall see how long that's going to last <laughs> but um, so y you you spoke a little bit about your role and um, I mean in the tech world in general um, there has been this discussion of um, are you a blogger, are you a journalist um, mm -hmm. and whether that's necessarily um, good or bad to call yourself only a blogger or maybe um, well you're a columnist um, but there has been this discussion of uh, is the uh, like like term and idea of uh, journalism uh, changing with the new things happening on the internet and of course traditional publishers also trying to find um, their new role and new business models maybe and I guess 
what I found about you is that uh, at many places um, you you have written for um, it I either says uh, okay she is a uh, is a writer or uh, education technology writer sometimes I find journalist how do you see this whole discussion and is it yeah. at all important for you no, I actually think about this all the time because, for one thing, my background isn't in journalism. I, um, well, I mean, I think I worked, like many people who were interested in writing in high school, I wrote on the high school newspaper. But other than that, I've not taken journalism classes or really um, um, had, um, prior to working for Read Write Web, a journalist, a journalist job. So um, in some ways, I don't feel like I, I don't feel like um, a journalist. Uh, and increasingly, um, I'm doing more, I would say, analysis than sort of mm -hmm. reporting. Um, and I think that that's a funny thing about the tech sector as well. Um, oftentimes, we're responding to press releases. Um, we're responding to news that's sort of given to us, as opposed to going out and sort of doing investigative journalism or um, sort of on the street reporting and so I'm 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 not sure what I do counts as journalism and so I well I mean I suppose it does but I prefer calling myself a writer too and that way I think when I um, I'm pretty opinionated <laughs> so I don't have to worry about you know this sort of question of objectivity um, I feel more comfortable being able to being able to point out things um, and say, you know, um, point out sort of the ridiculousness, perhaps, of, of some things um, without having to worry about the sorts of writing that journalists do in which they have to sort of do the both sides, um, you know, talking to both sides of, a, of an issue. So I, I call myself a writer. I prefer that. Yeah, I think although we... Uh, I guess look at education or maybe more specifically online education often from from different angles but what probably combines or, or uh, unites um, the work we both do is probably this um, looking deeper and, and trying to find the motivation behind um, some of the things. Uh, may it be a, a new release or a statement or, or whatsoever, rather than, uh, as you said, always um, interviewing or portraying both sides and not being yeah. opinionated. And uh, But you're right. I was thinking about this um, a lot as well and whether there was still associated more value to the term of a journalist, whereas for myself I decided now that's okay to call myself blogger because that's essentially mm -hmm. what it is. Or maybe I might see myself, as I also give opinion um, usually in my articles, a columnist is probably um, uh, okay as well. So... Um, yeah, but uh, I think it's an interesting discussion. And um, well, I think that I think that you. One of the things that I love about your work is that you also have a lot of experience and expertise um, in teaching yourself, and so you speak from a particular position as someone with a lot of inside and expert knowledge of the field, particularly around language learning. And so I think that that's a very different thing than a lot of. A lot of um, a lot of journalists who who they perhaps it's this a beat that they're assigned to cover, but they're not necessarily they don't necessarily have a lot of um, other expertise as um, well. I mean, most folks most folks do have expertise as a student at one point or another, but they don't have a lot of ex experience thinking about teaching, and they don't necessarily have experience in the classroom or haven't thought about some of these things. I think that's something that you. I mean, I notice about. Both the work that both you and I do is that we have spent a lot of time um, in the you know thinking about education technology as practitioners and not just as someone assigned to cover the story. And I think that makes a big difference in the things that we notice that other people don't necessarily pick up on. Mm. Yeah, it's actually how um, my my personal blog um, got started. Uh, it, it, it was more um, because my background, just like yours, is is quite different. Doing law school, um, but then my 
um, my first job was actually uh, tutoring, still um, offline, and I was then, after um, some years, looking what the uh, possibilities or opportunities might be um, setting up a business uh, online. So this is, of course, yes, where I come from. So it um, grew more organically that I was always... Um, sort of focused on the uh, probably business side of things because yeah when you're yeah. freelance you have of course to see of course you use the tools so you have right. the the insight there but certainly you also have to see um, when you're not like many of the startups uh, funded by somebody but uh, you have to see how um, to make a living yourself so of yeah. course you also um, look uh, at the business side of things and this was how um, I first got approached by um, some of the uh, other, some of the colleagues in the tutoring space that they asked me, okay, how did you do it? How did you use some of the, um, well, back then, I guess we can call it social media and marketing tools. And yeah. how was it possible for you to establish your little uh, tutoring business online? And what did you do? What we might um yeah, didn't succeed in doing so. Um, and uh, yeah, but this is, of course, um, I guess some of the history um, people can know about myself, but not necessarily mm -hmm. always do know. So yeah, um, yeah that's a um, that's little bit of... Uh, of background, um, of background there. Yeah. And, um, yeah, okay, let's go, I guess, right in the topics you love. Uh, <laughs> um, one of your last articles is called Viva la EdTech Revolution, um, or the revolution that, uh, that isn't. So talking about, um, some of your favorite topics of, uh, MOOCs, DRMs, uh, and so on. And I guess MOOC, uh, although the word is so, or the term is so overly used probably, and everything is yeah. a MOOC, although it might only be just another online course. Um, but uh, give me your your take on um, the whole uh, thing and how it uh, also referring to one of your your last keynotes there in uh, Toronto I think in in, <laughs> in Canada everybody can um, of course read the transcript on uh, hack education but um, what are maybe still some of the promises uh, about MOOCs if they are true to their core and their intention and um, the dangers you see where they are sort of being um, pushed by, by some of the uh, more, well, startup or business-oriented uh, providers now. I think that this is one of the things that always that sort of irks me greatly is that oftentimes, and I, and I know that part of it is the way in which the technology sector very much likes to portray what it's doing as new. Like everything is new and it's exciting and innovative and revolutionary and disruptive. But, you know, really we've been using, or, or even when we just talk about learning online, we've been learning online for a very, very long time. In fact, you know, when you think about the development of internet technologies and of web technologies, those did happen arm in arm with universities. And so this notion that somehow suddenly last year classes moved online thanks to a couple of Stanford courses <laughs> is really sort of ridiculously ahistorical. And so I think, you know, I, I do think it's important to think about what, you know, what are we doing, what are we doing differently now? And really, what are we doing that is in some ways the same thing that we've been doing online for a very long time. Um, and I think, and what are the ways in which we're actually teaching online in ways that are similar to what happens in an offline scenario as well? So, so are we using these tools, these new tools to do really, um, new things? Or are we just sort of repackaging in, in the, in, in many of these classes? Are we just repackaging a lecture experience mm -hmm. and sticking it onto the web? And that's one of the things that I find kind of pretty disappointing about a lot of a lot of the MOOCs that are becoming so popular 
is that in some ways, all that we, you know, we know, we do know about how students learn best. And I mean, as a tutor, you know, the best, actually, the best way to learn is a one-on-one -on -one tutoring experience mm -hmm. with someone. And so that's actually personalized. <laughs> that's actually, you know, a deeply human and responsive way to teach and learn. A lecture is sort of the antithesis of that. And a lecture, a live lecture, um, whether it's, you know, mediated through technology or not, it's very difficult to, it's very difficult to sort of, um, to, to, to interact with students on that sort of personal level. And so what I see with a lot of these new classes is that they're really, they're really doing a lot of what we know is sort of the worst way, the worst way to teach, which is, which tends to be these massive lectures and, you know, put on, put into all those short, short snippets so that they do, they do sort of appeal to a, a different sort of attention span than say the hour long college lecture, but a short five, eight minute um, lecture followed by multiple choice tests, mm -hmm. which again are sort of very inferior forms of assessment, uh, or can be inferior, pretty inferior forms of assessment. So, and those are very, that's a very different, that's a very different way of, of thinking about a MOOC than the initial, the initial concept, um, that kind came from, you know, out of Canada. This notion that George Siemens and Stephen Downs, Dave Cormier, Alec Koros, others promoted, which was rather than having a massive online lecture, thinking about the ways in which online affords a different sort of massive, not having thousands of students in the class, but being able to make connections, thousands of connections through a network. Um, and so again, rather than delivering a lecture to those students, um, allowing students to sort of forge their own learning and figure out the paths that are interesting to them and, you know, build their own knowledge rather than this notion of sort of filling students, filling students brains with knowledge. And so I, it's yeah. a very different, it's a very, it's a very different vision of what technology can, can offer than these classes that, or than these MOOCs that have become so amazingly popular in the media. Yeah, I would agree. So um, nowadays, everybody, uh, oh, well, paraphrasing a little bit, but a lot of people seem to take the uh, individual um, elements or, or letters, the, the M for massive or some, um, the open, uh, maybe it's not even open, so they skip the open, so it's just a massive um, online course then, um, paid or non-paid, although we all know, um, of course, the, the true uh, intention of uh, MOOCs to not being um, commercial, but but yeah, I um, I would agree with you that um, the massive part seems to play a major role rather than actually developing on the the concept of um, how can we uh, distribute um, the lectures and make actually learning meaningful. When I look at a good amount of uh, of these MOOCs, yes, what they essentially are is that they are uh, online lectures and then have some social elements uh, glued to them yeah. or, well, the, the magical thing seems to be the, the study groups or, um, well, then maybe having sort of a blended MOOC part, online part, mm -hmm. uh, offline to, to sort of increase um, the the retention rate or not having so many dropouts or something like that so which is essentially a little bit sad to to see uh, as a development in um, in that whole space I think so too and I think it's it's interesting because you know when we think of you know again going back to 2010, 2009, when, when you and I started this, the iPad was this very exciting, like ever, like that was the headline. That was the, yeah. you now it's the MOOC is going to revolutionize education. But back then it was the iPad is going to revolutionize education. Mm -hmm. And I remember being really disappointed when see, particularly with the Apple's textbook announcement, thinking, mm -hmm. ugh, like of all the things we could do, why would we want to like bring, put the textbook, I mean, just adding like, animation, you know, you know, animations when you flip the page and being able to like embed videos and highlight things is not like the textbook itself is sort of an, an old model. Like 
let's ditch that. Let's think about other ways that we can assemble and remix and find content. And we are no longer limited by the textbook, I would say, in a digital era. And interestingly, now the MOOCs feel very textbook-like to me. They just mm -hmm. feel like a textbook that's being read out loud to you. And every, you know, at the end of every section, there are quiz, you know, little quiz questions that you can take. So it just feels like a, like a textbook. I mean, it's a, it's a more, perhaps a more exciting and, and animated notion of a textbook, but it's still a very like controlled, um, conscripted, closed off way of thinking, thinking about how do we deliver knowledge to, you know, to, to students. And so I do think it's a, it, to me, it's a very, it's one of the things that I find really disappointing when we have these new tools and we tend to sort of do the same old thing with exciting new tools. Yeah. This, this whole uh, discussion technology for technology's sake and not for mm -hmm. the sake of, uh, of learning. And I think textbooks or digital textbooks in general are pretty disappointing for <laughs> for a number of reasons um, and you mentioned some um, I mean I guess uh, I have been writing probably about them yeah like Yes. since 2010 or so and always ask also um, having some um, of uh, these companies um, or representatives um, in some of the interviews here on EduQuest um, uh, one of my questions was always uh, okay when do at least prices come down um, yeah. because yes they were talking a, li a lot about those nice features annotation highlight um, sh maybe sharing but uh, then again we come uh, into the discussion of openness uh, yep. versus closed environments and so on and I still uh, and uh, well and the answers were always like uh, yeah this is eventually going to happen so we are in 2013 <laughs> and it's still not happening um, so maybe this is something we have to say goodbye to um, but uh, yeah do you think um Motivation behind that is that there are still enough of the established players and even some of the companies. I don't know if you don't, if you necessarily want to, to mm. call a no or so or maybe check to some extent, um, a startup still with a huge <laughs> amount of funding, but, um, that there is pretty much an agreement that they they want to hmm, revolutionize or maybe modernize certain aspects, but not go um, too far in the sense of um, what you just said is the idea of a textbook as we have had it for such a long time still appropriate? Is this the way we should think about that? Or should we liberate ourselves and um, think of how to distribute or consume content in completely um, new ways, but that these people feel, okay, there's still good business to be made, so why should we advance things too quickly? Um, it's not in our interest. I think that this, this is really what I find really interesting about um, education technology in general, is that the education industry remains dominated by the textbook, the, the publishers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Pearson is, Pearson is sort of this giant, and Pearson, even if Pearson, you know, even if the text, the print textbook industry goes away, Pearson definitely has sort of its tentacles into lots of other, yeah. lots of other areas, um, particularly around assessment, um, uh, and the sort of increasing interest in, in students' data. And so I do think, I mean, I do think that, I do think that we, that a lot of these, you know, the Cheggs and the Nos are certainly, I mean, they've built, they've built their, their business around, a, around the textbook. And I thought that the, I thought that the announcement with Coursera partnering with Chegg mm -hmm. was, and, and the part, and the publishers involved was pretty indicative of how entrenched those particular forces are in the industry. So we talk a lot about disruption that, um, it's sort of one of these buzzwords that we invoke all the time. And really, those big publishers are so entrenched. They're entrenched 
in schools, they're entrenched in the classroom, and they're entrenched in the, in the technology as well. So it's hard to see, you know, it's hard to sort of see where the disruption is coming when the big mm -hmm. players are sort of at the forefront of this, of this sort of digital re revolution. Um, and then, and that was certainly my feeling again back to the iPad. You know, that was my feeling with, here's a moment where we can do something different. And Apple partners with, with Pearson and Cengage and the largest mm -hmm. textbook companies. And again, here we are where we could do something different. And mm -hmm. Coursera partners with Chegg and then, um, some of the larger textbook publishers as well. So, you know, old wine, new bottles, really, a lot of this feels like. Can you tell me, because uh, you are much more, uh, let's say, um, not in touch, but maybe I think you have a different and interesting um, perspective and insights on the uh, university side um, of things, mm -hmm. because um, I have asked myself uh, now with the MOOCs and the universities uh, are basically the creators of content. So they, I see them from the outside perspective in a much stronger position um, compared with somebody of just uh, being the distributor or creator of a platform and the technology behind uh, most of the MOOCs is not rocket science. So um, it's <laughs> it would be easily uh, replicable for uh, a university um, as well. Why is it that the universities or the, the stakeholders feel that they have to jump on the MOOC train and um, associate themselves with one or the other name rather than doing a MOOC true to its core um, and really um, well-developed academic MOOC and uh, and I mean um, to find somebody to um, do a little bit of marketing and so on. So that's that's just the outside that uh, can be easily uh, added to to the core. But but why do they sort of give up their strong position as um, the creators of this valuable content? All of the different startups uh, or nonprofits uh, in edX's case want to have. I think that this is such an important question. And interestingly, within the last couple of weeks, we've noticed a number of um, universities that have put the brakes on moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, and, with, and not just with the MOOCs, but with some of these partnerships with other, with other companies. And I think that this is a question that universities really need to think deeply about because there is no doubt in my mind that as we move forward with any kind of education, whether it's um, whatever whatever your age, is that technology is going to be important and the internet is going to have a huge role to play. So I think schools need to think carefully about what expertise they develop in-house and what they want to outsource. Because the, the need to have people who know the technologies that know how to run a camera that know that know what instructional design looks like in an online um, in an online scenario are going to be increasingly important. And so, do you want to have that expertise on your campus, or do you want to hire somebody to run that the piece for you? And I think that that's you know that's going to be. And in, a, and in a time of budgetary crisis, you could see why on one hand it might sound appealing to have someone else um, handle that. But as I said, as, as technology is only going to be more and more important, I would think that many universities will want to sort of, I would hope that they would want to bring that, keep that expertise in-house, develop capability and capacity with their, not just with their, you know, not just with instructional designer and tech uh, um, IT staff, but actually help their professors think deeply about good teaching practices. And again, it doesn't, this isn't just a question of sort of online is bad and offline is good. I mean, my God, there are terrible, like, there are definitely terrible classes offline. So I do think that, you know, if nothing else, we're starting to have these conversations about what does good teaching look like? I think that that's really important. But I also think 
what what should universities manage themselves and what is what's what are they where are they willing to partner right now i think that the partnership with coursera in particular feels very much like a marketing effort it's like mm -hmm. i'll get my name in the paper like perhaps david brooks will mention me in the new york times yeah. there'll be a big splashy thing and we'll look as though we're doing cutting edge stuff cuz that seems to be the the message that this is the cutting edge thing that universities are doing and so doesn't everyone want to be on board with that train but but i think it is interesting that several universities have said uh we want to think about it and mm -hmm. we want to develop it we want to develop it. we want to develop the courses in house and we want to develop the technology ourselves and not just not just do something because um because that's the hot new thing to do hmm. What do you think? Not not to bash anyone or to to speak about one of the MOOCs in uh, particular, but um, why do you think all this hype uh, around Coursera? Because um, I mean, admittedly, I just had very early on a quick um, possibility to to interview them, and well, naturally, they don't spill their their secret sauce and uh, and tell you everything but um, i was actually not that excited about what they had or what they were presenting as um, as a vision and And many of the things, yes, I think their marketing team is excellent, yep. and um, and yes, I think they are everywhere, speak everywhere, and um, definitely got um, probably the most universities on board mm -hmm. um, with them, and and also, yeah, admittedly, they are the um, sort of darlings of the tech press in Silicon Valley, specifically. Um, but uh, I don't know. In its <laughs> in its core, I didn't. I wasn't wowed by um, what they told us. I feel I feel the same way about actually um, about all all of the major MOOCs. I feel mm -hmm. um, I feel that, and I find it really interesting. In fact, that that they all have roots in the artificial intelligence exactly in, uh, artificial intelligence yes. department. Mm -hmm. So of course, Sebastian Thrun the um, co-inventor of, of the mm -hmm. Google self-driving car. His mm -hmm. office is right next to Daphne Kohler and Andrew Ng, who are now the co-founders of Coursera. And then the, um, the, head of, um, the head of edX also was Ananda in Agamal. MI, MI, yeah. MIT's C, uh, um, AI department. And what's, but what's interesting is that, that that particular, their particular background in artificial intelligence is different than many of the folks, say, at Carnegie Mellon, mm -hmm. who've been doing, who've been thinking about teaching and learning and artificial intelligence for decades now. And so one of the things that strikes me about all three of the major MOOC initiatives is that they haven't, they spend a lot of time working on teaching machines to learn, but they haven't actually spent a lot of time thinking about humans. Teaching humans, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's not like there are some things that I would say, sure, that's an engineering problem, but there are many things, particularly when it comes to learning, that are just fundamentally a human problem. And I think that your, your, you know, your notion that the technology isn't that exciting is striking. I mean, You know, having forums, internet forums, as a place for for us to discuss anything. I mean, that's like the earliest. That's one of the earliest things that that the internet gave us was was the forum. That is not exciting. That is not innovative, and it's not particularly productive. I think. Um, I think, or it can be very difficult to manage it in a productive in a productive way. And so I think that a lot of this just has to do with the Silicon Valley hype machine that that mm -hmm. they had a very compelling story that the that the you know that the enrollment in those Stanford classes was incredible. Um it it dovetailed into a great story. Um and it sort of it downplays all of the other stories even I think within MIT which is so fascinating is that we seem to have completely forgotten that MIT has had open courseware and has posted all of its 
um, its faculty have posted their syllabi and many of their lecture videos and their exercises online for over a decade now. And suddenly that's gone out the door. The two, MIT, uh, OpenCourseWare, and edX, are they don't intersect at all. Um, and it's this, again, it's this notion that what we're doing is brand new. No one's ever taught online before. Isn't this exciting? And I think many of us, once you have a look sort of behind the curtain, the, the answer is no. <laughs> it's not that exciting. That's what I appreciate so much about your work. And um, I think it's probably, to some extent, of course, also a problem in online journalism uh, if you are running after the, the, the next e exciting story or news coverage, if you then want to do so, or the um, infamous five plus top whatever apps, uh, <laughs> compared with uh, what you do, uh, really digging deep into a story and investing um, a lot of time to make a good research, but then, of course, being limited to probably publish two, three articles maximum, I guess, uh, a week. Um, yeah. And but then, of course, I can always rely on um, sources uh, or articles uh, you write that uh, really look behind the curtain and um, I mean, you had a particularly insightful one as we were talking about uh, MOOCs, how the story of MOOCs um, mm -hmm. and how they have, uh, yeah, sort of emerged um, and came into being um, is now being rewritten on, on Wikipedia. And I guess not many people... <sighs> And we are all competing for eyeballs in to, right. to some extent, of course, that not many people today, um, yeah, t take the time to to reflect and uh, necessarily always look what is the original source of something. But it is maybe too easy to just uh, yeah hit retweet or reshare. <laughs> and um, how do you make this possible? for you and what you do with Hack Education or your other, um, well, if you write guest posts or um, or something, is it, I mean, you don't like to make compromises, um, <laughs> um, but uh, how, do make, how do you make um, Hack Education work or is it when somebody invites you to, to write a blog post that they um, then of course, a yeah. monetary stream comes. I mean, that, and that's been, that has actually been sort of how I've been able to sort of make, um, you know, do things is by freelancing elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But really, um, and that was what I was doing, as I said, when I, when I started, when I started the site. But over time, particularly as I felt the, as hack education has grown and grown in popularity, I've tried to devote more time to hack education. But this question, I think that this question of monetization is really challenging for anyone right now who's doing online media. Because you don't want, or I don't want to fall into the thing where it's advertising based and I feel like I have to write stories mm -hmm. that are going to get, you know, the, you know, top, like you said, the top 500 iPad apps that you, <laughs> that you can use in your classroom sorts of stories that do seem to get a lot of retweets, but they aren't thoughtful. Mm -hmm. um, so I do have, I mean, I, I ask for donations, which people have been very generous supporting me. Um, right now I'm working on a book, which hopefully will, you know, I think hopefully will sort of underwrite my world. And I've been doing speaking, speaking as well. Um, so it's, you know, I think it's, you know, it's the hustle. It's a different sort of hustle, but finding the places that I feel um, are right, that I feel comfortable with ethically, um, but then finding the places that where I can, you know, write, uh, do some freelance work as well. But, but again, trying to spend as much time and give as much attention as possible to the kind of stories that I write on hack education, which I know are fairly unique in terms of what other, what other folks are writing about, particularly the more mainstream tech blogs. Mm -hmm. The things that they write about, um, are, are usually, usually make me sort of angry. So. 
does it make you angry when um, founders, for instance, prefer to have their story on some of the more main um, tech outlets um, rather than coming to somebody like us where you get, I would say, more insightful and deeper coverage with, yes, maybe a few less retweets or shares, but uh, that's a whole different discussion what a retweet today compared with, I guess, right. 2010 um, still means and what the um, effect of a retweet is. But uh, sort of for yourself, and I have, well, I had to ask myself the same discussion, uh, the same question, but um, the discussion basically, can you live with, with being more niche and that's fine with you because you mm -hmm. stay true to yourself and you write about the things um, you want to write about and also you write it how you write, uh, you want to write, or is it sometimes a pity that somebody comes, let's say, early on in their startup life to you and they want um, sort of um, the initial coverage and then as soon as they feel, okay, we are big enough, we go to the yeah. now to the real uh, big blocks. I, I think about this a lot. I mean, and sometimes I have to chuckle because when I see, I mean, I, I often, I mean, I ask a lot of questions. I mean, and I'm really not interested in just rewriting a press release or just mm -hmm. talking about the things that, that that companies want you to talk about. I mean, I think that there are questions questions that, uh, that teachers and students want answered that, um, for better or for worse, venture capitalists and TechCrunch, the TechCrunch-like audience, don't questions that they don't even know to ask. And so I do think it's a pity when things become really popular and if you'd ever sort of, if you'd ever showed it to a librarian or a school teacher, they would have said to you that sort of basic business development too. They would have said, wow, this is actually completely ludicrous. This will, this will never work in my classroom. Uh, how did this, you know, how did this raise funding? How did this, how did you get this far that, um, that someone didn't sort of raise their hand and say, um, with, with some of, with some of these questions? Um, but I, and I think that these are the, these are the things that as the technology, you know, as, as we're getting more and more interest in education, that I think hopefully entrepreneurs are going to get, start asking some of these questions themselves. Um, I would hope that venture capitalists start asking some of these questions too. Um, it's because due diligence doesn't, in my mind, mean really how big is the market size and does this, does this product have an interesting business model? When you're talking about education, and I would say when you're talking about healthcare and some of these other um, niche sectors, that there are other questions we should ask as well. Does this, does this help learning? Um, is this going to make, is this going to make, um, is this going to make sort of teachers and students' lives easier? And what does that, what does that look like? And so, I mean, I understand, I do understand, particularly when it comes to, um, the interest of having your story told in a publication that venture capitalists read. I, I mm -hmm. totally understand why startups, um, why startups want to go to some of these publications. But most, the vast majority of teachers, the vast majority of college professors, the vast majority of administrators at any level do not read TechCrunch and do not. So you're, you're telling a story to an audience that's probably not your customer. So I do think that that's a trade-off that I'm not sure a lot of companies are, are thinking through when they are so interested in the tech crunch coverage and not necessarily interested in how are they, how are they reaching out to the people who are there, who mm -hmm. are actually, um, the, the, you know, their, their customers. It is, of course, also um, part, I guess part of it is what we see and I never know what really to to prefer because we we see a lot of people I guess uh, looking at education now from a more entrepreneurial point of view and probably mm -hmm. that's also their their background and basically see the opportunity mm -hmm. and I see and well, <laughs> admittedly, these are often the people <laughs> I'm talking with. Um, and then on the other hand, I see 
it increasingly difficult for some of the teachers, teacherpreneurs, or somebody mm -hmm. generally with an education background, um, maybe being less glitzy, um, less my my marketing skills are less well developed. And it seems to be much harder to have access to uh, venture capital, to activate their networks, um, and so on. And um, what would what do you prefer? Do you think generally teacherpreneurs produce uh, or create better services or products rather than the entrepreneurs now seeking their uh, luck or, or chance in education? I think that this is, I mean, I think that this is such an important question right now because, you know, the, with, with many exceptions, I think oftentimes the other piece that I find is that many of the teacherpreneurs don't have a lot of, um, engineering experience. Mm -hmm. And so they can have a great idea, um, and a, um, a product that is solving a real substantive, um, problem. And they could even have sort of built something themselves, but it's really not like the amazingly cool yeah. technology that you could have that you see sometimes, you know, the sort of um, tech talent in other prod products that you're like, wow, if you'd only, <laughs> if you'd only worked more closely with educators, you guys could have really built something, um, something interesting. And I think that that gap between the engineering talent and the educator talent is something that we really need to help help bridge because it's not, it doesn't even feel like it should be an either or thing. I mean, we really have to, you know, we, we should really be working on tools that are, that are solving a problem. I mean, right, that's, that's sort of, that's sort of the basics 101 of, 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 of building a technology tool, of building a business. And so you see this gap between the teachers who, who know what the problems are, but aren't, as you say, aren't able to sort of get to the next step. And then the, the um, many many education entrepreneurs who are building something that maybe solved a problem that they imagined teachers had, or the, a problem that they had as college students, which is a pretty typical one. Yeah. Um, and so I think that any efforts that we can get to get educators, to get educators, entrepreneurs, and engineers, those are the three. You know, you, you need all three. I think we have to work a lot harder to bridge bridge the gap because there's so much misunderstanding and I think lots of ill will. I mean, and, and deservedly so. I mean, I think that the technology that many teachers and many students have in the classroom is oftentimes the worst technology. I mean, I'll, I'll, I always use Blackboard as my as my go-to example, but it's ridiculous that a tool like Blackboard is still sort of being being sold to schools. I mean, if you look at it, it looks the same as it did in the late 90s. It's sort of strikingly, it's sort of strikingly 90s software. And I think that, so I think that, I think that many educators do sort of have, um, have a lot of mistrust about the things that they're being sold. They have a mistrust about the technology and the businesses. And so we have, and then, uh, and then similarly, there's particularly in Silicon Valley this attitude, the sort of anti-education, anti-teacher sort of uh, education is broken because somehow teachers are lazy luddites, mm -hmm. or you know. And I think that so we we have a lot of work to do to sort of bridge the bridge cultures and sort of make amends so that great engineering talent can match together with understanding teaching and learning, and that we can actually build something more interesting than the 800th iteration of a learning management system, which, <laughs> you know, everyone's, that's sort of the easy go-to, like, oh, I want to build an education company, so I'm going to, I'm going to take out Blackboard because I know that the technology is shoddy. So, and there's a market, yeah. so venture capitalists love it too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think you, um, you you mentioned the the important points on uh, on the one hand um, apparently there's so much little less here in Europe but uh, even here it's possible to to now raise more quickly and um, mm -hmm. but 
But definitely in the States, apparently there's so much capital out there that um, a lot of the ideas get funded if you have a nice tagline, we are the <laughs> so-and-so of education <laughs> or we take on XYZ and mm -hmm. um, make everything better, uh, cheaper, more open and, um, well, Often in the end, not everybody, many exceptions, but uh, in the end we just reproduce this and become sort of the next wave of right. learning management system. Um, <laughs> and then, and then yes, I think this is this is important. Why? But I don't know who to blame. Probably both sides. Mm -hmm. Why um, tech talent or entrepreneurs? don't rely on research carried out by the universities or sometimes I guess also why do universities not approach startups and um, sort of do something together because they know how to do good academic research and this work but they keep it amongst themselves so they keep it in academia and I often feel um, This is, this is true for, for many things. Many of the groups in education want to stay amongst themselves and they don't mm -hmm. even talk with one another, um, not to say even work together, which is really a pity. I think a part of it is that cultural, some of the sort of cultural divide, because I think many people in education are very reluctant of, of the money question. I think that, um, So I think that there's this notion that somehow money is bad. Mm -hmm. It's it's strange that money is bad and that we aren't entirely comfortable with thinking of education as a business or thinking of students as customers, thinking of teachers as customers. And so I think that that makes a lot of folks uninterested or unwilling to sort of connect with entrepreneurs. They see them. They see it as you know, that profit is going to be extracting value away from something that should live in a space that is sort of free from market influences. Um, but I, I think you're right. And I think that there's, I think that there's also this notion that many of the great projects that happen that get research oriented projects that happen at universities, they don't take that next step and become, get spun out into businesses. And that's never sort of the intention. Even if they come, even if someone had come up with a great idea, it's often grant funded. Or if the student graduates, mm -hmm. that's sort of the end. That's sort of yeah. the end of the road. The grant ends. The student graduates. The dissertation is complete, and then it sort of gets packaged up, and no one looks at it again. Um, and then finally, I think that you know a lot of the people who are making the purchasing decisions at schools aren't the teachers, they aren't the professors. The administration um, administration is wooed by marketing. They're wooed by um, sort of the, the sales and, and flashiness of the sales, but they aren't the folks who are in the classroom mm -hmm. um, having to sort of bang their heads against the wall with some of these ideas. So I think that there are a number of things that, a number of things that, that, that make it challenging. And I'm hopeful that This notion of more startups being able to reach out directly to students and teachers will help. Um, not that I mean, you can't ever skip the administration. Somebody has to sign the check at the end of the day. But I do think that at least being able to connect with um, teachers and students helps startups build better products, so that they're not building something that just appeals to the administration. That they're actually being able to connect with with um, with what happens in the classroom too. Mm. Of course, also one challenging thing uh, at the beginning, we talked about how many startups are popping up every week and are looking for coverage and also, well, yeah. sometimes with really good ideas, but oftentimes um, when they uh, sort of ask me to have an initial talk or sometimes also mentoring uh, already myself and not knowing by far not knowing everybody, but can name three, four, five services that roughly do yeah, the same. Same thing. Mm -hmm. And and then of course uh, they get some funding, initial seed, or maybe also a little bit more. But for teachers, of course, how long uh, or can we really rely on this product is here to stay? Um, because huge, yeah, yeah, this is a huge problem. And someone was. 
um, someone was talking to me um, the other day about this, saying, you know, they they suggested that I was being too critical of startups, and you know that how that the that these research projects on campus aren't sustainable, and I think that that's this question is startups, particularly once you've raised venture capital, by definition aren't sustainable. Like there's a trajectory that you're on that often ends in acquisition, um, if not sort of you know, aqua hire or mm -hmm. um, so these startups are going to go away, and I think that there is rightfully so, a reluctance on the part of many, many to adopt a new technology when you have no idea, particularly if there's not a clear business model or there's, or that they've raised so much funding that you have to assume that, you have to assume that Pearson is going to gobble them up mm -hmm. sooner <laughs> rather than later. And I mean, I think again, back to talking about these industry giants, Pearson is sustainable. Pearson has been around since the late 1800s. I mean, that's, that's sort of the sad. That's sort of like the sad reality is, is that the that the the startups might be doing new and interesting and innovative things, but many of them aren't building a long term business. That's the nature, I think, of of the startup is that most of them tend to be smaller smaller pieces that are going to be acquired by somebody else. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But often with the attention, of course, also I dedicate three, four years maybe and yep, then I, I want to be bored. And also when I'm in my, let's say, mid, late 20s often uh, nowadays, um, I, how realistic is it that I'm really working on my best idea? Not yes. very much. I don't have very much of an experience yet. So, mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, I, I also see that a lot of smaller ideas get uh, funding and then they make an exit after a relatively short amount of time. And, um, and I guess your point from before, um, people in research or ac academia being a little bit reluctant to, to the role of money, Although it is funny when we think of these giants in education, the publishers, um, mm -hmm. also what we see with some of the MOOCs definitely need to be, uh, based on their funding, need to be profitable um, someday yeah. in, in the future, um, <laughs> that money has played a very big role, um, especially in higher education Absolutely. as well for a very long time. So... So yeah, but okay, maybe criticism aside, what are, um, and we have been talking for, for almost an hour now, but, but on the positive side of things, what are um, some movements or maybe ideas, credentials, badges um, uh, that excite you and you really see if executed in the right way or in a meaningful way have some um, potential to really make an impact on uh, the future of education? I think one of the things that many of these technologies um, and many of these sort of things that are being hyped are prompting us to do are have a conversations about what good teaching looks like and what, what, what are our goals with learning. Um, and I think that, you know, Khan Academy is a great example of this. It's, it's, I would say it's it's great that it's a free resource, but it's actually if you talk to sort of um, great math teachers, they'll say this is actually the Khan Academy isn't so wonderful. But it's mm -hmm. actually prompting us to have conversations about what good math teaching would look like. What do we want? What do we want teaching? What do we want teaching to look like? And uh, so I think that that's that's to me what's really exciting is that we're starting to pay attention, starting to really pay attention to these things and. I think that we're wrestling with, you know, we're wrestling with this notion of gap, capturing more data from students. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are lots of, lots of issues at stake that I think are, I'm happy to see this conversation. I'm happy to see education become something that, um, that the tech sector, but more broadly society is, is talking about. What do we want to fund? And does this matter to individuals? And how does it matter to sort of the greater public good? Um, so, I, and I'm, I think that we still will see the increasing importance of openly licensed content, openly licensed code, open source, and OER. I think will be 
will be will be crucial because of the necessity of remixing and um, um, mashing up whether it's whether it's code or textbooks. And I think that both of those put the put the put the agency back in the hands of the learner, so that you can actually be active in building your own education and not just the recipient of a textbook, not just the recipient of someone else's program, but you can actually build things yourself. And to me, that's what learning should be. It should be about how do we put the tools into everyone's hands so that they can can build the things that matter to them. So they can follow their own curiosity, their passion, um, and not just sort of be these silent, sort of these silent zombies um, in the classroom. So that's what makes me excited about these things. On the educator side, of course, as well, with all admittedly justified criticism about uh, Khan Academy, but um, this was sort of the first thing I was thinking about um, when this criticism uh, emerged that I thought, well, the tools, the technology is there. If you know how to do it better, then do it and not only talk about it. Right. Because this is actually... I. I, I guess this is one of the what you just mentioned, one of the the great opportunities at the moment that mm -hmm. if you have an idea, it is either cheap or even at no cost uh, able to be uh, to, to realize it or to to make it happen, and um, and and yeah, that we are really living in a in a time where many things are possible much more than than in the past yeah and i think that i mean i think that i think you and i are both great examples of that of that too is that you know these technologies afford afford us the ability to to sort of to showcase our ideas to talk about our work to connect with other people um in in ways that we, we couldn't you know we, we couldn't have done before and i think that that's You know the, the the opportunity for sort of again like world you know worldwide connections and being able to being able to reach out across borders and learn from other people is I think amazing. I, I mean I'm I'm grateful. I'm incredibly grateful for the for the tools that you know you you know as, as annoying as Skype can be, for example. I think that these are these are really these are the, you know the ability the ability to connect with someone. Live across the world, I think is is we've only just started to think about what that's going to look like for education. Absolutely. So everybody, read hackeducation.com. <laughs> <laughs> Follow Audrey on um, on Twitter. Um, that's very easy. It's just her name at uh, Audrey Waters. Um, anything else you would like to point people to? Well, I just want to. Thank you for having me on for your hundredth show, and congratulations on a hundred. That's a huge accomplishment, and I think you've been such a great resource for startups in the space. So thank you for all your work that you've done, Kirsten. It's good. Well, I have to thank you to come on my jubilee episode <laughs> <laughs> and providing um, so many great um, insights and value. Um, now also um, on on video and not only um, in in <laughs> writing. So no, I really have to say um, we should have probably done this earlier. Um, <laughs> and um, no, I really um, enjoy and appreciate what what you do. And uh, I think it's really important to have somebody. Um, digging deep into um, the matter and um, getting to the to the core sometimes of a problem or uh, a story so thank you good, good job thank you <laughs>